Hope everyone's well. Thanks, David, for the uh, music and uh, looking after us. You're the best. You know that. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, David. Today, we um, the topic is uh, Reclaiming Dominion, and I want to spend about uh, 20 minutes on that, uh, and in particular, uh, the aspect of let's call it critical mass and how we can contribute to the critical mass so that when enough people have decided that they want to be sovereign and they want to know themselves and stand up in dominion, then the whole world follows, you know, like the hundred monkey syndrome. So uh, <laughs> that'll be interesting. Uh, and um, then I want to talk about uh, Obert. And this is his great work, The uh, Metamorphosis. Now, he was a uh, writer in the, um, well, first century BCE, and I think his life uh, spilled over into the first century CE. So he was around um, at the time of uh, Caesar Augustus. And, and in fact, Caesar Augustus exiled him uh, because... Um, he introduced new laws in Rome about marriage mm, and monogamy. And you can't have more than one wife, etc., because they wanted to... Uh, well, they, they wanted marriage to be sacred, you see, and uh, so that they could have um, bigger families, more slaves in the empire. And so Ovid was uh, talking about... He, he was one of the first uh, poets in history to write uh, in the erotic genre. Mm. <laughs> so he wrote the arts of love and uh, etc. And uh, so he was exiled because this man knew himself. He was a um, hermetist. Yeah. Uh, or a Neoplatonist, you could say, or um, Pythagorean. It's all the same stuff. It's all science. It's all pure science. So, but we're going to, this is one of his great uh, poems. And um, the reason I'd like to read a portion from this in the uh, 15th book, a portion called uh, The Life of Pythag Pythagoras, because Pythagoras um, has been a, um, a divine hero and exemplary. Uh, person in history that many, many people have modelled their lives after. Not because he was perfect, but because he was a great science, scientist and, um, and a genius. That cannot be doubted. So many people, Ovid included, and, and, and all the great Roman philosophers and hermetists and uh, all the way to, uh, to today, people are still modelling their lives on Pythagoras. One of the greatest hermetists in history. In fact, he went down to Egypt to learn all this. So um, the reason we're going to be um, including that and, and is because um, he knew himself and he wrote about the soul and the spirit and the nature of all things. And it all harmonises perfectly with, well, uh, the holy science, all of my presentations, and in fact, uh, in the next few weeks, I'll have uh, two more new presentations up, uh, and it deals a lot in the hermetic science and um, the true philosophy, the perennial philosophy, actually. That's the one of the uh, designations, the perennial philosophy. It ain't never going to go away. <laughs> And no matter how much it's been persecuted by the Christian, uh, the corporate Christian, that is, um, it won't go off. It's been persecuted for um, a long time, and uh, it's time for it to return. And we are the ones that are leading the world in ensuring with our contribution to this science that it will return. And the founding fathers of America... 
they they hoped that they could uh, found a republic, um, and they did. Oh yeah, they did. Um, the Renaissance times. These guys in the Renaissance, they were basing their conscious awakening. You see, it wasn't an, an intellectual awakening. It wasn't an intelligent awakening in, as such. It was a consciousness awakening. And it was founded on hermetic wisdom. Yeah. And the person entirely responsible for it would be Cosimo de Medici and his um, teacher, Marsilio Piscino. Now, I'm speaking a lot about that in my two new presentations. So look out and you'll, 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 I've put a lot of new information in here. So I've really, really done, um, done a lot of, uh, put a lot of new, new information in there, and which is pertinent, very pertinent to everything you probably know and what you've seen on my presentation. But um, just want to make a distinction on something I just mentioned, the difference between an intelligent person and a conscious person. Um, in Hermeticism, there are two kinds of people on the planet, the sleeping masses and the conscious human being. The sleeping masses are considered to be human beasts, human animals, because we are, we do have an animal body. This is, this is anima means soul, and a soul is a compound. It consists of spirit, mind, and body. So spirit would be what we are, soul would be who we are, and body would be um, where we are, <laughs> right here in our bodies. Um, but there's a big difference, and, and this is where you see these intelligent, educated people that are in positions of power that are human animals, presidents and kings alike, and... Um, they never will reach, many of these never will reach human being status, the hero, the conscious, awakened, divine creature. That's the potential we have. That's what we got. And as Thomas H. Burgoyne says, that um, one lifetime is sufficient for one to grow from animal to human being or to conscious, awakened, Christ-like uh, creature. So uh, this is what we're going to discuss and, um, and Ovid is an exemplary in the holy science. Absolutely an exemplary in, exemplary in the holy science. In fact, Thomas H. Burgoyne and all of these great guys that I work from recommend this as the first work in your path to liberating yourself from the body to the conscious spirit that you are and return to divinity, this is the one and only greatest masterpiece. This is up there with Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey and anything hermetic. It is, it's pure Hermes. And um, most of it is, is devoted to mythology. Now, in the West... Rome has taught us to think of mythology as stories. Oh, yes, uh, old, uh, antiquated stories that don't really have any meaning but entertain the um, intellect, you see. They, th they, they, they have you believe that uh, once upon a time um, people used to write these mythologies and just entertain their, their en intellect, you know. No. These... These works are there for the conscious awakened creature because the human animal will never reason enough. Intelligent as they may seem, and they are very intelligent and astute, very clever. Animals are clever. Um, but in fact, um, these uh, beasts disguised as human beings, as Hermes puts it, beasts disguised as human beings, will never get this mythology. It's beyond their grasp. So, um, blessed are you, really, for want of a better word. Uh, well, that blessed is a fine word. <laughs> but um, 
joyful and blissful will you be when you understand the mythologies and when you connect them to the as above. You see, man, according to Hermes, is the measure of the universe. Man is the measure of the universe. So anything you want to know about the universe, you are the measure of it. Because you are um, uh, a galaxy of stars, atoms. And um, so Hermes teaches that you just need to understand what your true nature is. And then you can measure anything that goes on in the universe. So it's very, very exciting, guys, and uh, it's great for us to be around in this time. That's why we're here, because we didn't come here so that it would all go to poo. <laughs> we came here so that it would go to bliss, and we're, we're steering it and way showing so that it will happen. Now, um, the aspect of reclaiming dominion is very important because, you see, on the secular level, Rome has got us in its grips, so to speak, or the world at least, not us. But uh, they've got to us because we're believing in our bodies, you see. And so we give it a name and that gets registered at birth and then they send you a, uh, a fine in the mail for speeding, you see. And they send it to an address that they've been given with a name on it, you see. So they, they're, they're, char they're, they're sending a fine and charging you for obeying one of their parliamentary statutes um, via your registered name. Now, that, so, so, so that fine is not sent to you, the flesh, blood, living spirit person, human being. Now, I've got to be careful when I use the expression human being because, <laughs> because in legal terms, it means a beast. Okay, so, and they've done that deliberately. English is a very deceptive language and um, it's, it is mostly a Roman invention. Please don't think that English is um, an, an Anglo-Saxon, predominantly an Anglo-Saxon uh, language. It has a lot of Anglo-Saxon in it. And it uses that syntax, the Anglo-Saxon syntax, and it uses um, a lot of their structure. But it is at least 60% 60, 60 Latin. Church, uh, English is a Latin sister language, officially, like French, Portuguese, Spanish, and um, Italian. Now, English, though, has been designed as a language to cast spells on people. This is why they want us to learn English all around the world as their first language or second. English is taught everywhere because it's a language of enslavement, just like Latin. They are both very, very sinister. And um, according to Franco Collins, who is a fellow Australian researcher in Sydney who runs uh, TalkShoe and many... Um, he runs the um, University of Eucadia website and um, etc. You can see those linked to my website when eventually my website gets up again. <laughs> it's been down for 10 days. Um, Franco Collins says there that um, it was um, the finishing touches to the English language were concocted in uh, Rome at the College of English in the 15th, 16th century. There you go. And you can check out his, his um, research into that. It's a legal language, you see, which binds people. So um, what this means is when they send you a fine, they send it to your registered name, your legal entity. You see, and we respond thinking, oh, yes, well, that's us. No, it's not. It's your um, corporate fictional name. And they are charging your trust. You see, everything is prepaid. Now, this is the point I want to get to about reclaiming dominion. And um, understanding the fact that uh, our trusts that were created at the moment of our birth shortly thereafter 
once our uh, birth certificate uh, was registered with the um, local regi government registry, uh, three trusts are created, and they are Roman Catholic corporate trusts, which puts us in a trust agreement with our corporate governments. You see? And we are the beneficiaries, but so are they. But we are the sole shareholders, and they are not. And we are the uh, sole beneficiaries. You see, they make themselves beneficiaries by the fact that they are um, acting as um, owners or, well, trustees of the, uh, of the trust. You see, the, these were set up by the government. So, but the reason why we need to know about these trusts, these Sestri KB trusts as they are known, is because they are worth millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. In fact, um, some guys out there like Tim Turner and Rob Menard are suggesting that they're worth billions. Uh, well, at least Tim Turner is. I'm not sure about Rob Menard, but Tim Turner in a, in a video that's uh, kicking around on YouTube called uh, America Can Be Free, says there that um, many of the system UK tr trusts are generating billions of dollars. Now, the banks are getting access to these trusts, and the government lets them. And uh, guess who else is letting them? And this is the big revelation, because this is what we need to alert people, the public, to. Uh, and that is the corporate religions. The corporate religions are also in on this. How? How are they complicit? Well, <clears throat> the corporate Christian churches don't tell you when you walk into their church and um, become a member and a fellow of their, uh, their craft, and you actively partake in their organisation, they consider this to be, um, you're a member. Um, you know, they don't tell you about any rights you might have by the Constitution. They don't talk to you a lot about reclaiming dominion and, and, and sort of standing away from the government as a sovereign entity and a sovereign nation. They um, don't talk much about that because, um, you see, they're waiting for uh, God's kingdom to uh, come along and, and fix this, uh, the governments, they've, they've run them up, you see. So God's going to come, interventional, interventionalist, good old theocratic God, he's a man in the sky, he's, he's male. I don't dare think that he might have some feminine attributes, because he's a boy. Uh, and um, <laughs> this, is, this, is how, this is how sick churchgoers are, they're, they're sick. In, in that they can reduce God to a gender, you know. Um, the science uses genders only in principle, okay? And the principle is electricity is masculine and magnet magneticism is feminine. But you see, they believe that God is, is a boy, he's male, and he's going to intervene. So you don't need to be sovereign. Blessed are the poor. Okay, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit God's kingdom. And just believe that, and do you have any uh, loose change in your pockets? Because there's a donation uh, box out the back, and it's empty. And we love it when it's full. So rather than telling you to uh, dip into your trust, which they are doing, <laughs> and paying for everything via your trust, because everything is prepaid, including our utilities, and I showed you how to do how to uh, pay from your prepaid account. You have a trust number, and it's worth millions, so they can use that, and, and they are anyway. Um, they, they can use that to pay for their services because governments are being paid by us, by our trusts. <laughs> so the, when they ask you for um, your income tax, well, that should be yours. You work for it. You own that. You see, it's illegal. It's unlawful, rather. It is legal. It's unlawful. It's against the laws of the universe, people, friends. And um, these, these are sort of things that uh, definitely make me, uh, make me furious. I don't know about you, uh, but it makes me furious to know this. Uh, as a Jehovah's Witness, 
um, an ex-Jehovah's Witness for 22 years. I don't recall ever the elders or the ministerial servants talking about sovereignty and the fact that, um, brothers, you realise you might be worth millions of dollars because the government we're under that we're um, being sodomised by and that we're telling you to um, subject yourself to because the Bible says that God put them in their place um, is um, stealing all your wealth. And that's why you're poor. <laughs> uh, I don't remember any of that. In fact, I, I do remember the brothers saying, brothers, we have no rights. We have no rights except the grace of God. Yeah, taxation began in Australia as a volunteer, voluntary donation after the war, exactly. And in America, it was implemented uh, only recently in the last century, probably, uh, I think, in 1913 or 14 or 15. I might be wrong. It could even be 1930 when, or 33 when uh, America went bankrupt, see, and sold all of its chattel, the American citizens, uh, to the um, Zionist Catholic uh, cabal bankster ruling elites of Europe. You see? So, um, <clears throat> so you see that um, we've been sold by our governments and uh, our clergy class are not saying anything about it. Interesting, isn't it? It, it just, it's mind-blowing to think that these spiritual leaders of the flock are not telling you how to get your um, your own hard-earned wealth to have access to it and your, um, your rights. Because basically that is one of our God-given rights or divine rights. That would be better. That's more of a, a deist expression than a theist expression, God-given rights. Because that tends to suit the, the churchgoers when they hear that, God-given rights. Yeah, so you better believe that God or we'll... Um, what do we do when you don't believe in our God? Uh, kill you? Would that be okay? Well, I don't think they were that generous when they killed 300 million indigenous Indians when they came across the Atlantic with their boats, with the crosses on their sails and their Christian corporations. Uh, excuse me, Indigenous Indians, uh, Jesus is coming to your, to, your, um, to your little block of land and uh, he wants it. Uh, we need to shed a lot of blood too because you've got the wrong religion. <laughs> you know, all this Indian stuff and the uh, shamanic uh, things that you do, it's all wrong. Uh, Jesus came 1,500 years ago, uh, and he's debunked you. You've got it all wrong. Uh, you're not spirits. Uh, in fact, you're animals, and that's why we um, conscientiously are able to go ahead and kill you. I don't think any hermetists took part in that destruction and bloodshed, people. <laughs> yeah, it was good old churchgoers. Blood-shedding types. So people, uh, the reason I've shared this with you and all this information about the trusts is, um, you know, uh, next time uh, churchgoers are happy to talk, preach to you about uh, God's kingdom that is coming, we might want to remind them that uh, we could have God's kingdom if we reached critical mass of consciousness and not animal intelligent buffoonery, intelligence, animal intelligence, but human consciousness. And we could reach critical mass and we would have God's kingdom already because the kingdom of God is within. I think um, their so-called uh, Jesus, uh, their uh, leader said that. The kingdom of God is within you, if I remember correctly. Oh, yeah, and he also said, love your enemies. Well, sorry about you uh, 300 million indigenous Indians about, uh, about that. Uh, you are our enemies and we shouldn't have killed you because Jesus said we're supposed to love you. But we don't really uh, pay any attention to his words anyway. We're a corporation. And the corporation that did that was the Vatican. So, people, we need to get it out there that this poisonous, filthy, putrid, animalistic entity called the Vatican 
is um, still um, buzzing around with its little inquisition and stealing our wealth through the trusts and telling all their very, very well-funded so-called Protestant churches to tell their idiot priests, animals equally as animalistic as the animal kingdom, that um, we are supposed to bend over and be sodomized and not expect to be sovereigns. This is absolute treason. All of the churches of Christendom are treasonous, and we need to get the word out, basically. Uh, try not to do it with the same kind of uh, anger as, uh, <laughs> as good old me, <laughs> uh, because we need to be loving, because these are our brothers. And if you get too angry um, and you go back, say, six or seven years in time, you might actually um, catch me in there with them believing the same stupidities, because I was one of those. So uh, let's hope that we plant the right seeds to these churchgoers so that they can understand that treason is being perpetrated on them. And they will never find their sovereignty and their divinity or anything unless they turn their backs on these churches and get out. Get out of Babylon the Great, my people, if you do not want to share in her sins. Babylon the Great is the elite let me qualify the word elite when we're referring to the elite. We need to qualify that expression. They are not the scrupulous or the conscious elite, the spiritual elite. They are the economic, capitalistic elite. That's all they are. They are bourgeoisie scum. They are animals disguised as humans. Therefore, like Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is one of these animals. When she announced that um, uh, Colonel Gaddafi was killed and, uh, you know, they sodomized him with a knife and, uh, and she was rejoicing. It's just so great to kill. Oh, fantastic. We've killed someone. It's just so great. Let's rejoice, you know. Um, no compassion. She's not about to tell the universe that she's sorry that one of her cor corporations is actually going in there and, uh, and shooting and, and, and all those mercenaries that they're hiding, that they're hiring, all these young animalistic men who are happy to go out and hold machine guns in their hands so they can just go around and see how many heads they can blow off. It must be fun watching head, people's heads just go poof, <laughs> you know, in their minds. It must be just fantastic to watch little children get blown to bits with these machine guns and Hillary Clinton's... These are animals, people. Don't please... Please understand that the world is full of human animals. Understand it, you know, and uh, but understand it with compassion because there's a chance that these animals can, can transmute in one lifetime if they come to their senses. And it's our, hopefully, <laughs> something loving and kind that we do to reach out to them that will enable them to... Um, to be saved, because that's what salvation is, it's consciousness, and to leave the animal consciousness. Yeah, uh, I'm just reading some of the nice com uh, comments. This is fantastic. Yes, um, the sheep copy the shepherd's adulation. <laughs> Love that. Thanks, Cardamina. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, guys, uh, I mean, we can we can... Thrash some questions, uh, some questions and answers on that one in the next uh, hour. But for the next half hour, I'd like to go to the positive things because I always like to talk about the secular way in which we need to reclaim dominion and also the spiritual, the true way, the true path. There's only one path, guys. There's only one science. We transmigrated our souls transmigrated to this solar system for some reason or another, okay? Many of us come from other, um, from other systems and have been in other systems, uh, but here we are now. We're right here on Gaia, on planet Earth, and there is a science as to how we got here and how we can return. And it's not religion. <laughs> it's science. It's pure science. And it's such a relief to know this. You know, as soon as you start suggesting this to churchgoers, they go, oh, the devil, and they run. This is how badly mind-controlled 
they are. They run. They run from the, the only science that will ever free them truly. They run with their tails between their legs like dead, like, like um, scared dogs. Absolutely filthy scared. Um, guys, I don't know where to begin when I talk about this very, 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 very um, short chapter dealing with um, Pythagoras. Okay? Ovid was kind enough to leave us a few pages, probably about, uh, well, let's see. The teachings of Pythagoras start here. Now, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pages, or 14 pages. And they are the most beautiful, most treasured um, classic works of all time. Ovid was an exquisite genius. And, of course, as I said, he was um, ex uh, exiled from Rome. Um, in the first century BCE by um, Augustus, Caesar Augustus, for um, being, um, well, being a wise hermetist and teaching people about metamorphosis. What does metamorphosis mean? Well, awakening, for one, uh, transformation, transmutation, alchemy, the holy science, that's what metamorphosis is all about. You know, we don't, we don't expect to stay in these cocoons forever. In fact, we know that we only have short life spans. You know, uh, if we live to 90 these days, it's great. But uh, a lot of people are dying in their 30s and 40s and 50s. So that's a pretty short lifespan. Really, when you think of it for a great crea creation that mankind is, was such a wonderful creation. The minds that we have, the, the, uh, the way the heart work, phatic system with the dimethyltryptamine that comes from this fella. And by the way, the dimethyltryptamine is the blood of the Christ. You see, when the scriptures say, and you shall be saved by the blood of the Christ. Well, that's the, um, the DMT that gives you the visions, that gives you the consciousness, that awakens you, that's the blood of the Christ. In other words, if you don't get up to heaven in Aries, if we don't climb that energy upward, the better, the better ethereal energy of the top three chakras, from the heart chakra upward, if we don't get up into that, into the higher mind, which is called the higher mind, which can... connect us to far, far greater universal consciousness. So, um, and I shared, I shared this recently on one, one of the radio shows I've just done recently. I'm not sure which one, but um, I, 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 um, I, I shared a lot of this um, of um, Pythagoras. So I'm not going to be reading a, a, great, a great deal, but some of the choice bits about sovereignty. And he says, um, this is what he says. Uh, a God is directing my speech. I will speak as inspired, revealing, as though I were Delphi, the secrets of heaven, disclosing mysteries known but to the illumined. You see, Illuminati, like elite, and all of, all of the words need to be reclaimed. Uh, because uh, people who... Um, use these words to deceive people, you see. Once upon a time, elite was, the elite were the aristocrats, the, the, the rule by the best, not rule by the, the cash best, the wealthy best, in terms of material things. It was the, the spiritually conscious evolved ones from the community would be given elevated or responsible positions of... Um, administration in the republic. So we don't be let's not be deceived that elite means anything scrupulous. 
I will sing of great issues never be, never before uncovered by earlier thinkers and hidden until the present. For it delights me to travel up into the heavens, delights me to leave the earth's insipid abode and riding on clouds mount to the capable shoulders of Atlas, where I can look down on those wandering mortals, lacking in reason, anxious and fearful of dying. Mm, anxious and fearful of dying, lacking in reason. Mm. And from there, exhort and encourage them by unrolling the scroll upon which fate is inscribed in succession. O oh, people, stunned by the icy terror of dying, why do you fear the sticks? Why are you frightened of phantoms and names that mean nothing and empty blather of poets, foolish hobgoblins of a world that never existed? Here is what happens after you die. Your body, whether consumed on the pyre or slowly decaying, suffers no evil. Souls cannot perish, and always on leaving their proper abodes, they come to new ones, living on, dwelling again in receptive bodies. In the time of... Uh, now, let me skip that. I wanted to go to... Uh, everything changes and nothing can die, for the spirit wanders wherever it wishes to. Now here and now there, leaving with whatever bodies it chooses and passing from feral to human and then back from, from human to feral, and at no time does it ever cease to its existence. And just as soft wax easily takes on a new shape, unable to stay as it was or keep the same form, and yet it is still wax, I preach that the spirit is always the same, even though it migrates to various bodies. And so, at the risk of repeating myself, I exhort you, lest your devotion be vanquished by the greed of your bellies, stop this expulsion by slaughter of spirits so like you, this practice of feeding one creature on blood from another. He was a vegetarian. Of course, being a Pythagorean, you cannot but be vegetarian, because Pythagorean hermetists will not eat anything that has cost the life and shed the blood of another creature because creatures are living in order to experience living. Makes sense, <laughs> you see. And um, when we were much more consciously awakened as a race, if we were in need of slaughtering an animal, we paid respect to that animal at least, in that it was our hands that slaughtered it and that we asked forgiveness and grace from the universe because the soul is lost. But uh, Ovid says, Ovid says this, and he um, raises a great argument for vegetarianism when he says, um, "Mortals re re refrain from defiling your bodies with sinful feasting, for you have the fruits of the earth and of arbors, whose branches now bow with their burden." For you, um, for you, the grapes ripen. For you, the delicious greens are made tender by cooking. Milk is permitted to you, and time-scented honey. Earth is abundantly wealthy and freely provides you her gentle sustenance, offered without any bloodshed. Some of the beasts do eat flesh to allay their own hunger, although not all of them. For horses, sheep, and cattle feed upon grasses, but those of untamable nature, Armenian tigers, furious lions, wolves, and bears too, these creatures take pleasure in feasting on what, on, uh, what they have slaughtered, um, etc., etc. Uh, I don't want to lay the point on vegetarianism because it's um, it's uh, only one of the aspects of um, the holy science, and of course uh, many of us are still. Um, you know, indulging in, in, in meat, etc., because of 5,000 years of having to, um, uh, having to, um, well, we've, for 5,000 years we've been eating meat to see mankind, at least 5,000 years. And our, um, you know, cellular bodies are used to it, so um, it's not the re recommended thing for someone to jump off meat and be a vegetarian overnight, and that can uh, cause uh, other trouble. So um, 
But um, the encouragement is, yes, to go more toward um, food that has not had an anima, a soul, uh, shortened its life for our better feasting, because we do already have, as uh, Ovid says, grapes and all sorts of fruits, and the, wood, the, uh, the, the earth does not hold back any of these beautiful, um, um, beautiful uh, fruits. So it's fantastic. And, of course, um, the uh, eating of organic vegetable uh, food is superior to animal food because... Um, because it doesn't have the um, the same kind of conscious fear. You see, when you cut a legume, yes, it does feel the pain, uh, but the consciousness doesn't. Um, it, the processes are not as as um, complex, and the personality developed by the animal is far more developed than a plant. And a plant is and. Um, an animal, the soul in the animal is the personality. That's what a personality is. You see, it's your intelligence. Your intelligent personality is the soul. So when you cut a personality, when you cut a, a soul off that has many, many um, conscious processes, it's more um, more harm and more trauma and, and karma and hurt. Um, than when you do so to a plant that doesn't have, uh, um, you know, the same kind of um, mental processes, just a, a, a low level of consciousness. Conscious nonetheless. Everything's conscious. Everything has spirit running through it. So, guys, um, let me just continue on a little bit more with Ovid because um, I give Ovid uh, thumbs up in um, everything, really. His um, clairvoyance his uh, wisdom, his choice of words, um, rather exquisite, really. So, um, he says, but really, do you not see how the year has four seasons? In imitation of how we pass through our lifetime, for tender and milky and moist like a child is the early spring, when the world is freshly green and lacking in vigour, Swelling with moisture, a hopeful sign for the farmer. Everything flowers then, and the fields are a riot of colour, although as yet there is no real strength in the foliage. Spring is replaced by summer, a more robust season, which in its vigour resembles a hardy young man. No other time is richer or warmer than this one. Autumn steps in, and the ardour of youth is replaced by a milder maturing, a time between younger and older, when the thinning hair begins to go grey at the temples, mm. uh, then winter's old age approaches us, lame and trembling, and whatever hair is still happens to have has become whitened. So um, isn't this beautiful how Ovid relates the uh, four stages of the, um, uh, the, the life, the youth, the adolescent, the um, mature man and then the old age. And uh, to the four seasons, spring, summer, autumn and winter. And probably the choicest portion in terms of science, hermetic science, in this chapter is where he begins to explain the uh, four emanations in which we live. And I've explained all of this in the science um, as above, so below video series and in the key to the whole science where the four elements are the four Kabbalistic emanations, fire, air, earth, and water. And um, we, as um, humankind, mankind, we dwell in the middle kingdom, you see. We dwell in between the um, fire and air above and the water and earth below. You see, because our bodies are made of water and earth, it's 80% water. Um, and our bones, the solid bones, would be the earth, and the gas would be the oxygen, etc. in our bodies, in the blood, um, and in our cells, and the fire would be the, um, the warm-bloodedness and the fire of the mind of Aries, the fire of the heart, uh, the warm-blood aspect, um, 
I said that. Uh, what was I? Uh, the radiance, the radiance of the cellular electricity, the electricity in the cell. So we're made of these. We're made of the four rivers which issue out of the Garden of Eden. And but we are in the middle kingdom. You see, we still have these bodies, but below us are the kingdoms of the mineral, the animal, and the vegetable. And above us we have astral and um, and uh, spiritual and and causal. And we have and this is the path upward. So we're in the middle, as the Hermetists say, and we have a choice of which way we want to go. Do we want to go up and forward, or do we want to go backwards? And uh, unfortunately, many have made the decision. Um, they, um, they have chosen the path downward. That's obvious. It's very obvious. People who are pursuing worldly entanglements like... Um, careers, climbing the corporate ladder, growing their investment portfolio, etc. All of these things are chasing after the wind. These people are materialistic and you find a lot of these in the churches. And they think that they're spiritual, you see, but um, they are churchgoers. They're more interested in their material assets than in, in, their, in their spiritual assets. But uh, their master taught them that um, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve riches and God at the same time. It can't be done. It never has been. Um, and this is what it means to be in the middle kingdom, in the intelligent middle kingdom of the intelligent animal. It's a chance to become a human being or a, um, uh, uh, a divine creature, put it that way, because of the negative uh, connotations of the word human being in the legal uh, sense. You might want to choose that. But uh, the point is, we have a choice. And this is what Ovid says about the, um, the world in which we live. Four genitive substances make up the eternal cosmos. Two of them, which we call earth and water, are heavy, and of their own weight will sink down right down to the bottom. But the other two, air and fire, uh, are weightless and will rise up if nothing suppresses them. Though they are, sp they are spatially distant, each element rises out of another and into another, into that other. Collapses when the earth is unbound, for example, it changes into water, then as it loses its moisture, it once again changes, this time to wind and air, and as it grows thinner, bursts into flame and rises through heaven as fire. From there the way is reversed, and in the same order, fire condensing turns into air, which turns into water, and fluid water changing to earth becomes solid. Nothing persists without changing its outward appearance. Nothing. You can never stay the same. Look at pictures of when you were a baby. Look at pictures of you 10 years ago, and you'll see the obvious changes. For nature is always engaged in acts of renewal, just as our bodies will grow, decay, get old and die, and then the soul and spirit seeks either another body. Well, it does seek another body, either a fleshly or a spiritual body. Nothing in all of the cosmos can perish, believe me, but takes on a different shape. And what we call birth, is when something first changes out of its former condition. And what we call death is when its identity ceases. Things may perhaps be translated hither and thither. Nevertheless, they stay constant in their sum total. I truly believe that nothing may keep the same image. For a long time, the old age yields to iron. And often places will... And often places will know of reversal of fortune. For with my own eyes I have seen land that once was quite solid change into water. And I have seen land made from, from ocean. Seashells that have been discovered far from the seashore. And the rusty anchors right in the summits of mountains. A former plain was converted into a valley by rushing waters. Whose force has levelled great mountains. And a one-time marshland has been turned into a desert, and thirsty sands have been transformed into marshland. These are facts. These are scientific facts. You see the tectonic plates moving. This is not because of um, consensus 
science um, uh, plate shifting? It's because the Earth is growing. <laughs> See, the Earth is just growing, and as it grows, the arc has to straighten, therefore earthquakes will happen. And volcanoes are just part of the fact that our sun, our earth is um, preparing itself to become a sun. And it already has a sun in its core, <laughs> an iron core that is so hot. It's so hot that it's like unto a sun. And as the earth grows and rota rotates faster and faster, which it is, and the orbit slows down, eventually it becomes a sun, as we all do. We're all headed for the stars, guys. Yeah. Shooting stars. So um, I'd like to uh, just um, re remind you of that lovely um, 15th book of uh, the Metamorphosis of, I uh, of Ovid. And uh, I would be, um, if you had some time, I'd be um, going through that and uh, contemplating his words. You see, um, Parmenides, the great uh, Greek teacher, said, uh, the great philosopher, I think he was not far from the time of Pythagoras, in fact. I'm sure he was about 500 BCE. And he said, uh, you must study the heavens. You must study the stars. Study them. Know them. Know them. Even in the Bible. Job 48.32. In fact, okay. let's read that. Job 38.42. If you'd like to turn your Bibles to Job 38, 32, dear brothers, we shall... Uh... <laughs> yeah, you've heard that one before. I certainly have. So, Job 38, 32, quite interestingly says this. Can you bring forth the Maseroth constellation in its appointed time? What it should be saying... Is this translation? But so this is, of course, a bad translation. It's the Jehovah's Witness um, New World. New World? Are you kidding? Hmm. New World translation of the Holy Scriptures. Man, they're getting trickier and trickier as they go. These people. Um. New World translation because it's like New World. Um, indoctrination, mind control. And um, you can tell it's mind control because uh, the idiots forgot to tra translate Maseroth into Zodiac. Oh, no, hang on. I think they did that deliberately. That would be to hide the fact that God wants you to uh, know the Zodiac. Yeah. But, of course, um, how many churchgoers are going to look in their Strong's Concordance and check the word Maseroth to find that it's that circle of wheel that the Egyptians gave us with all those scorpions and animals on there that want to bite you and it's that scary demon worship symbol stuff. Stay away from that. Ooh. <clears throat> Another thing Job says <clears throat> is, um, and as for the ash constellation, alongside its uh, suns, can you conduct then? The Ash Constellation, I think here is, um, if I'm not wrong, it's uh, Ursa Major. Have you come to know the statutes of the heaven, or could you put its authority in the earth? And Job 38.31 says this. This is quite interesting. Can you tie fast the bonds of Kimar constellation, or can you loosen the very cords of Kessil constellation? This is talking about Orion and Ursa Major and Scorpio and Gemini and Aries and Perseus and um, goodness me. And I think I've exposed in my videos that Samson means Shimshem, which means little sun, and uh, David means... Um, and David means uh, Toth, which means Mercury, the planet Mercury. 
and Moses means Mercury, and Jehovah is Jupiter, and Paul is Apollo. I think we've got some uh, some stars in our holy books. Stars? Is it? Would that be why we go to a minister? Or a pastor, or an elder. L would be the ancient name for the sun and Saturn. I wonder why we have a deacon in the church. Would that be ten degrees of the zodiac? I wonder why we have cardinals in the church. Would that be the cardinal signs of the zodiac: Aries, Capricorn, Libra, and Cancer? I wonder why we have bishops. Would that be three degrees of um, the zodiac? Hmm. I'm a little bit confused. They deny that they have anything to do with the stars, so I just wonder what they're um they're on about with all this uh, minister and pastor stuff. Hallelujah, brothers. Okay. Well, um, I hope you like my uh my dry my <laughs> my uh whatever style it is. It's my genre. <laughs> but um, look. We can have a laugh about it, and uh, we can be se- take take uh, this information uh, seriously as we are too. And um, guys, we uh, stand to benefit from the beautiful consciousness that is coming. Please uh, let's not um, let's not fall into the trap of um, thinking that sophistry and intellectualism and uh, education, according to Rome's consensus way, is going to save us. Uh, knowledge coupled with understanding and wisdom is the only salvation, and that is science, based on science, not hocus pocus. Not, oh, believe it, you'll be saved, for goodness sakes, Jesus will save you. Just believe it. What? You don't believe in hell? Just believe it. Um, (laughs) Consciousness, science, Knowledge, wisdom, understanding, love, service, all of these are salvation, people, friends. And um, so with that in mind, we can uh, continue on with that thought after the break. We'll have a uh, short break, uh, and I'd I'd like to um, get a cup of tea. I'm very, very (laughs) thirsty. Uh, so we'll uh, thanks David um, uh, prompting you there if you don't mind I appreciate that and uh, please guys uh, question and answers in the next uh, hour and uh, I would love to get some really good questions I'd love to tackle some really good questions and um, and uh, hopefully we can do it with audio that would be good if um, the moderator whoever it is today can help us with that so we can hear each other's voices if you don't mind I'd love that I prefer that than uh, typing in the word question and then having a question after it. I mean, if you want to do that, fine, but uh, I think it'd be nice. Thanks, David. Um, what do you think, guys? Uh, three or twelve? Any suggestions? Um, I'm happy for either one, really. I'm quite happy. Uh, I'll let you call that. How's that? Thanks, David. Okay, there's a... Lovely. Oh. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I did the opposite of what I was supposed to do. Uh, that was lovely. That was great, uh, Dave. Thank you. That was a really nice video. Absolutely um, thought-provoking, isn't it? To see that um, there are pyramids now being discovered all over the uh, Earth, the planet, and um, and to think that consensus historians have the goal to teach us, to tell us that we now are at the peak of historical sophistication and civilization and intelligence and evolution. Me thinks not. <clears throat> and uh, there's a great scientist called Michael Cremo. Um, I'm not sure if you're uh, aware of Michael Cremo's work, 
Um, but there it is, and he talks about the fact that um, there is more uh, devolution than evolution going on. And of course, that can be explained because we live in a cycle whereby we go to higher consciousness and then we go to the spiritual winter of consciousness and we go to sleep and then we awaken, regain our consciousness and forever, forever, for as long as we are stuck on the wheel of necessity, which is procession, incarnating, I mean, the average length of incarnation would be about 10,000 years. That's what the 10 years of the wandering of Ulysses means, you see. Uh, Ulysses was wandering in the Mediterranean to go back to uh, Ithaca. And he was had all these adventures and everything. everything. That 10 years is a symbolic number for 10,000 years, you see. So Odysseus eventually become